Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Plain Truth Podcast. I am your host, Steve. This week on Plain Truth, we're going to tackle a couple of different topics. I want to begin by uh, returning to the Melchizedek uh, topic that we had covered previously. What I'd like to do is just uh, just give you one more resource that would be helpful to you um, in exploring who Melchizedek is. Um, I gave you two prior. One was Chad Bird from the 1517 YouTube channel. Uh, Chad Bird does a nice uh, 20-minute study on who Melchizedek is as he takes you on a tour from the Bible and uh, also extra-biblical literature. Uh, But also the the Bible Project guys do a nice job with some short videos on the royal priesthood and Melchizedek. uh, character they, they do a nice job animating that it's good for young young people but i also enjoy those videos an awful lot peter gentry from southern seminary would be the third resource i would uh i would suggest to you he is uh, also on youtube um, take a look at his offerings as well he does a nice job a little bit more intricate with the melchizedek character but uh, nonetheless very very helpful for us, as we look at Melchizedek, um, there's one more idea I want to bring out to you, and it's this. So from the Genesis 3.15 um, passage that we looked at way back, I told you that that verse has primary importance, and I keep bringing it forward to you and pointing out different things to you up, uh, about it. Um, what we're looking for is this seed of the woman, this offspring from the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. And as the Bible story moves along, we get more and more data as to what he will be like. We also get plenty of data as to what he won't be like. Um, but, but, but here, the Melchizedek character is going to be brought forth once again much further in the story. But I want to begin there and look at that first. When we first encounter that Genesis 3.15 passage and we start to look at it, we are immediately on the lookout for who that might be. And, and as the, the different um, candidates come forward, <clears throat> they each in turn become disqualified. But then in turn, they also, through what they, uh, where they fall short and then where they succeed, teach us about what the seed will be like. Men like Cain and Abel and uh, Seth and Enoch and Noah and uh, Abraham. When Abraham comes along, we learn that the uh, seed of the woman will come through his family. One of Abraham's descendants would one day, many, many hundreds of years in the future, become king over Abraham's people, over Israel. His name was David. And David was the greatest king that Israel has ever had. He and his son Solomon. And David gave us many um, songs called psalms, many poetic song forms, song shapes that we have preserved for us in the Bible. And perhaps uh, one of the most important ones for New Testament studies is Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Now, God covenants with David like he covenanted, and we'll see today again, affirms a covenant with Abraham. And God's covenant with David gives us more uh, shape to that Genesis 3.15 character. Um, He will be king. He will rule over all the earth forever, one of David's descendants. And, of course, it is speaking of none none other than Christ Jesus. Uh, But before he comes, um, David prophesies in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 110, and if you were to turn there and study that psalm and then look at where it's used in the New Testament, what you come to realize is that this is the Apostles' favorite psalm. They refer to it quite often. Um, They see Christ there. Uh, But if you look at Psalm 110 and what David prophesied there in this this song that he wrote, it says this, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord is sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. And here it is, after the order of Melchizedek. 
The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. He will be exalted. <clears throat> what we learn here <clears throat> is that the king that will come from David, the one that will rule forever and ever, is a royal priest king. And that's who we're looking for. And as the New Testament um, describes our Lord, he, of course, is described as the great high priest and the king of kings. Okay, the high priest of all high priests, right? After this order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 7 talks about that. And he's described as the king of kings. Jesus fits the mold. But as the revelation of, of the seed promise progresses, Genesis 3.15, we get little bits and pieces all along the way. And this is another one that we see here. And the Melchizedek reference gives us some idea as to what his priesthood would be like. He would be one after the order of Melchizedek, Christ Jesus. And I thought that was very fascinating. So be on the lookout for these developments um, about um, who uh, Messiah will be, what he will be like um, as the story unfolds, as we um, examine all its twists and turns. The whole of the Bible is about Jesus. The whole of the Bible is about Messiah to come, the anointed one. Um, the whole earth will be his. It'll be full of his glory and righteousness will cover the seas. So that is another wrinkle that you should be looking for. That Melchizedek character comes back again and is a descriptor of Messiah to come. Okay, so now turning here away from that topic to a second topic that I wanted to bring up. As we move now from Genesis 14 to Genesis 15, what I want us to look at is just a few verses and then return to an idea from uh, several of the previous chapters and just point out something to you that I find is rather interesting. If we turn to Genesis 15, back to our Abram story, you just rem you remember the context. Abram has just had a great victory with this small guerrilla band of soldiers over these ancient Near Eastern overlords. And um, he is confronted by two kings, the king of Sodom, who was a wicked king, and Melchizedek, <clears throat> who was uh, a priest king of God Most High. We talked about that exchange last time. Emerging from that, um, from Abram's act of obedience in the wake of all that, not taking the plunder and placing himself sort of in the hand of the king of Sodom, but rather just um, celebrating this great victory this with a feast with the king of Salem, Jerusalem. God then comes and meets with Abram. And he says, it says in Genesis 51, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a great vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. So he did, Abram has just finished not taking all this plunder, that was to be offered to him. And God says, don't worry, I am going to be your great reward. Okay. Um, verse 2, Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will uh, be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And then he brings him outside. The word of the Lord brings him outside. This is another uh, episode where I believe we have a pre-incarnate appearance of our Lord, uh, Jesus. Uh, he brings him outside. He says, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And then he Abraham, we are told, and, and we've looked at this verse already. It's another really important verse in the New Testament studies. Abram believed the Lord, and it he was it was counted to him as it was reckoned to him. It should be better rendered, credited to him as his righteousness. Abram's faith is counted as righteousness. Okay, so Abram um, is now pleading the promise to back to God that God had given him that he was going to be a numerous people and. And be given a land. And, and Abram's like, Lord, you haven't come through for me on this. You know, a lot of time has passed since that initial uh, interaction with the Lord back in Genesis 12. 
Um, but the Lord will indeed, as we look at next time, formally covenant with Abraham. And, uh, and he will um, fulfill his vows to Abraham, his promises, and take Abraham's cause to be his own cause. And in so doing, God's getting his way and accomplishing that which God wishes and wills to happen. So we see the way that God is now interacting with Abram, and it gives us a lot of information as to how God interacts with us. If we go back to Genesis 12, to that initial encounter that is recorded for us, one of the things that God tells Abram he will do is bless those that bless him and curse those that dishonor him or curse Abram. And think about the interactions that we've had recorded for us as Abram has emerged from this um, time of of, uh, placing himself under God's care. Think first about this uh, most recent narrative we looked at when Abram with 318 men goes uh, on a righteous pilgrimage, on a righteous forced march north to rescue his nephew out of uh, trouble, and uh, he puts a, a, a beating on these warlords who are, you know, themselves evil men. Uh, how does that happen? The story of Gideon gives us a lot of information, if some of you are familiar with that. It, you, you can read those stories against one another. And um, what it tells us is that Abram trusted the Lord for victory. Um, that that Abram would be protected by God. He is his shield. He is his uh, he is his own reward to Abram, and God secured the victory for Abram. That miraculous victory with only three hundred men. So there's an instance of Abraham um, doing righteous deeds and God with him, securing a victory clearly from the Lord. But what about the episode prior to that that we had looked at so many times? Abram, this, this man that is held up as, a, as a, an exemplar of faith, we've already seen um, has many ups and downs in his life. And this is um, part and parcel of how the life of faith works. Uh, we learn often, um, God wastes nothing. And this is the idea I want to bring to you today. God wastes nothing. Abram, we have come to believe, I've come to believe, learns from his mistakes. He grows, as the Bible teaches us, through the ups and downs. And when he uh, when he was in the land that God had promised him and a famine struck, he ex- uh, exhibited a lack of faith in God's provision, even though in the face of all these promises, um, God said he would take care of him. Abram flees to Egypt, and we know in the Bible going down to Egypt is never a good thing. And there he gets himself uh, all worked up over the fact that he thinks that uh, when they see his wife, when the, when the Egyptians see his wife, if you remember, they're going to kill him to take what Abram has, including Sarah, to have what, to have what Abram, Abram has, you know. To, and so Abram uh, hatches this plan, puts his wife in great danger. Now, this is where it gets scandalous because it puts God in a very, if I can put it this way, a very awkward circumstance because God has already told Abram he will bless those that bless him and curse those that curse him. Now, Abram has set Pharaoh up to um, to get him in grievous trouble, grievous harm, because it, uh, the Abram's wife, Abram's um, the promises that God made are under threat now um, because of Abram's actions, not because of Pharaoh's. Pharaoh is acting guiltless in this although he's taking another woman into his harem. That's a separate issue. But Abram had deceived Pharaoh to a degree in order to save his own neck, once again exhibiting a lack of faith. And God, I believe, intervenes. You can read Genesis 20. Um, Abram pulls this stunt again later on, and we get more detail in that story where God actually intervenes and uh, confronts Abimelech and says, "Don't, don't take Abram's wife. And Abimelech says, well, he told me she was his sister. (laughs) And so Abram pulled that stunt again. So Pharaoh was somehow notified, hey, don't touch her. And uh, there's an interesting interplay there. Because you have a replay of the garden episode. How so? Well, Pharaoh is acting, who is a serpentine figure typically, right? A serpent figure is now, who would be a deceiver, is now the one being deceived. 
Sarai, or Sarah, is an object of the deception. She is forbidden to Pharaoh, and yet Abram plays the part of the deceiver or the tempter by deceiving Pharaoh. It's a fascinating inversion of the garden story. Abram should have acted righteously. Pharaoh, obviously, being an unrighteous person, actually comes across as righteous in the story and rebukes God's man. It's fascinating. There's a lot to be learned from that story. Um, Chiefly, we don't want to be rebuked by the world when we act unrighteously. Um, It's not a good look. But God, God is not an author of sin. God is not an author of deception. So God needs to step in in order to prevent this thing from happening so that he can then carry forth what he promised he would do. Abram places God in a very precarious situation. And that's the lesson for today. Our actions as we witness to the glory of Jesus Christ to the world around us as ambassadors um, can paint God in a very bad light if we are not careful. Now, here is the thing I want you to recall. You can always redeem your mistakes. You can always learn from, from, from doing things in a less than stellar manner. In, in other words, when, when you, even when you make mistakes, they can be used of God to teach us. It's always this way. It's like, I hope after you realize you've handled a situation badly somehow. You've, you've sinned against God. You've done wrong. You know what God de- desires you to do when you don't do, or you, you know what God desires that you don't do when you do it. And when you come to the recognition that you've done something like that, it's not just salvation that's at stake. If, it, at stake. if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're forgiven, but you don't presume upon His grace. I hope it breaks your heart a little bit. And you just kind of look at the whole situation and you say, thank you for the grace that is ours in Christ Jesus, for the forgiveness that is ours in Christ Jesus. But the thing that should grieve us most in these circumstances is the love of Christ that's been shown to us should constrain us in that moment. And what we realized is, is we trampled that grace in that moment of sin. And we paint God in a bad light. And it really should break our hearts because of the extent to which God went to to redeem us from the wrath that was rightly due us. Paul says the love of Christ compels us. It constrains us. It causes us to move forward and want to do good in the wake of the grace shown us in Jesus Christ. And it constrains us from wanting to do evil. Right? It's, the lo- it's reflecting upon the love of Christ that's been shown us in, 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 in what he has done for us by dying for our sins on the cross, bearing the wrath of God for us, bearing his own wrath rightly due us for our sin, for our wrongdoings, for our transgressions. And then he rose to give us eternal life. And so what we want to always do is reflect upon that and let that motivate us, not for performance, What's this love relationship? Like, look at what God has done for me. And uh, it's that love um, that that compels us and constrains us from doing wrong. We don't want to paint God in a bad light. We want to witness to his grace. And you can redeem those bad situations when you have those moments of public failure. You can redeem them by just confessing out loud that you have come up short. As James says, confess your faults one to another. I hope you have a community of faith where that's that's legitimate and acceptable, uh, that you can have that openness and vulnerability with people. Um, uh, It's important. Humility is important, and, and it's developed in the wake of these things. Well, that's all I have for you this time. Just reflect upon the story of Abram and so many fascinating twists and turns. Um, I hope you are blessed by what you see today and hear today in the Word of God. And uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you, make His face to shine upon you and be gracious toward you. See you next time.